looking over at her brother Tim going, what is wrong with him tonight? <laughs> and how about this guy right here, you know, Mr. Serious all the time. You know he could not wait until he sang this hymn this evening. You, there's no doubt about it. I, I tell you, the only thing that makes him almost as excited as this morning when he got to do birthdays. When he gets to do that, he really gets excited about that. So we can put a smile on that guy's face. We sure can. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we do thank you. We look forward to what you have for us. And, you know, we enjoy and have a lot of fun with that wonderful hymn. But what a wonderful truth. Love, your love, love lifted me. And Lord, I would only pray that if there's one that uh, that we're thinking of, that we're lifting up right now, that doesn't know the love of Christ, uh, that you'd just save them, Lord, and use us any way we can uh, to express and convey uh, this same love. And Lord, we look forward to tonight. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's all be seated. I, did, I was so overwhelmed with that wonderful hymn that let's share a few announcements. Um, again, let's continue to pray as we see things happening here. And uh, don't forget Children's Ministry and also Bible Institute. Bible Institute, get plugged in, see Mrs. Miller. And um, for sure, just make up your mind, no matter what, if you're even just a little bit curious, mildly curious, come on in for those first two Mondays audit the class you get to have you'll be six hours of Bible Institute uh, for free and uh, just the Lord will bless that and use that no doubt about it I also want to mention we talked a little bit about FBMI uh, brother Gary is at a Spanish-speaking church tonight uh, uh, having an opportunity to hear from a um, a man who might be candidating um, as a missionary and so be praying for them he also told me that they do have a team from their sending church about eight uh, fellows coming down uh, in, a, in a van with tools and they're going to be working uh, at FBMI on Saturday Monday and Tuesday and if there's anybody who'd like to come out and help uh, give a hand um, you can sure do that if you're interested at all, if you if you can make it out there, I can uh, get you Brother Josue, his phone number. He'll be here. Brother Gary is going to be also traveling and preaching, uh, but um, they'll, they'll be out there and ready to go. And so if you have any more questions about that, text me or, or uh, call me. We even still do that around here, actually talk on phones, and we'll get that worked out for you. Amen? Amen. Let's continue. Oh boy. Put my paper clip over two pages. What was that? 496. 496. <laughs> Oh, 
Please stand, if you would, for the offering. And turn to him 511. 511. just saying speaks right to what we're going to be talking about in just a little bit when it comes to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Brother Benny Mejia, would you look to the Lord for us, sir? Let us pray. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this, this evening here in your house, dear Lord, giving to you all the praise and all the glory, and thanking you for your Son, for your Word, for our salvation. Lord, just be you with Pastor Miller as he brings your message to us this, this evening, Lord. Fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Now we pick up this offering, Lord. Again, we pray that you'll multiply it and be used for your ministries here in your house, dear Lord. We pray all this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen. <laughs>
I heard this song earlier this week, and it made me think of my dad. It always does. Um, he would always stand over my shoulder, and he would sing, and his voice would just, it would stick. And so this is his favorite song. I like you to listen to the words. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Scotty, and you know, I can sure appreciate that that would have been one of your dad's favorite hymns. I can't help but think of somebody else whenever we hear that song. Anybody know of anybody here who's now stepped into glory? And you can always guarantee, uh, I'm here, we sang that song. It was song also be the song he would pick if we were just picking out hymns, and that would be Buddy Stafford. Brother Buddy, what a blessing. And you know, then when you think of how that song speaks to being really uh, with the Lord, he is with the Lord today. This is my story, this is my song. What a blessing. Amen. Now let me see if I can find my notes as I got over here. I had notes, I'm sure I did. Let me see if I set them right here. Here we go. All right. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And 
the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Now, please scroll down with me to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. Let me say that again. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Over the last few weeks, we've begun to look at Bible teaching. I'll use another word. Some folks don't like this word in certain circles. Doctrine. Doctrine matters. Amen? Amen. You show me a church that is running from doctrine, and I'll show you a church that is running from the Lord. Doctrine. As we began over the last few weeks looking at doctrine, we come to now... The doctrines of our faith bring us to the incomparable Christ. The incomparable Christ. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we do thank you. And it really is true. That's more than a mouthful that there is no one, there is nothing that can compare to Christ. Help us to see that, to rejoice in this truth, and to know this in a greater way even tonight. That's why we'll take the time to look at what you have to say, what the Word of God has to say about, yes, Lord, you are Lord and Savior. And so, might we appreciate that maybe even for someone tonight, you you don't know this same Jesus. Today would be a good day. Tonight would be a good night to say yes to Jesus Christ. And as we still grow in our walk and relationship with him, when we come to a place where we understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that he, in fact, is the mighty Savior, uh, we appreciate in a greater way all that will be expounded upon tonight. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Notice again, John chapter 1, verse 14. What a great verse. What a great, great verse. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Don't those words just sing in your spirit? I mean, there's no doubt. I want to break it down just a little bit tonight, and I think we'll uh, sing even louder and longer when we appreciate, really, what's being said here. I mean, where do you begin when you talk about Jesus Christ? Uh, if our subject were some outstanding historic figure, uh, well, you'd begin with his beginning. <laughs> we would begin with his birth, his parentage, his heritage. But with Jesus, there was truly no beginning. That in and of itself is amazing, isn't it? I say there was truly no beginning. It before Abraham was, I am. Amen? Before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 8, verse 58. That also speaks to the fact that that's 
the very same way that God the Father refers to himself in the Old Testament. I am. So, really, I mean, one can begin anywhere and start talking about Jesus and never get it all said. There will never be enough print, enough volume, enough um, hard drive on your computer to, uh, to be able to exhaust all that there is to say about Jesus Christ. And so this is just a little peek into the important truths that we find in Scripture, but we want to break it down just a little bit. And so I'll attempt to choose some of the most basic facts concerning the Lord. And we, and we say this, and we mean it honestly, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know one preacher friend of mine, and I can't say that I always do this, but he tries very hard to never just say Jesus. I mean, he feels like it, it doesn't honor the Lord Jesus Christ uh, the way that he ought to be honored. And I got to tell you, the more we study the Word of God, do I need to stand closer to the mic? I'm not sure. I got an in and out thing going on. The more we study the Word of God, the more we see, the more we appreciate for sure that He is Lord. He really is. He is Lord. And so let's begin. Number one. All good preachers begin with the first, with number one. First, let's examine Christ in His pre-incarnate glory. We'll use a few 85 cent words tonight, amen? This is a staggering concept for the human mind. I can say, especially for my mind, doesn't take much, but there's much here. Everything has a beginning. But the Bible teaches that Christ had no beginning. He existed eternally with the Father. John prefaces his gospel with the declaration, as we just read and we have all read so many times in John 1, 1, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's a lot there for sure. He explains in verse 14 that what happens? That the Word is synonymous with Christ. The beginning he is talking about is that referred in Genesis 1.1. In other words, he is saying that Jesus goes back beyond the beginning to, uh, of creation of humanity. John chapter 17, verse 5 says, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. What a great verse. Not only does Christ exist eternally, but John records in Revelation that Jesus came as, we read in John chapter 13, verse 8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Because God is omni omniscient, uh, he knew that people would sin even before he created them. I'll let somebody a whole lot smarter than me explain exactly how that can happen, but that's exactly what does happen. When it comes to God, he transcends time, doesn't he? Because God's nature is love, he provided a way for people to be reconciled to their creator before they were even made in that dateless past Love drew salvation's plan. And in the fullness of time, Jesus came as the foreordained sacrifice for the sins of the world. Paul said it like this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of, of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, 
made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that he, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I got to tell you, with only an opportunity to glimpse into who Jesus is, only having the opportunity to look at just some of the very basic facts, it ought to cause us to hunger and yearn to know the Lord in a deeper, richer way. How about it? You, we're going to spend all eternity with him. Let's get to know him more and more, more and more. As we just sing about our blessed Redeemer, we want those words to be more than just words for us. From the Bible itself, we have abundant evidence concerning the pre-existence of Jesus before he was born of Mary. This right here is a conversation that needs to be had with a lot of people, especially here in the valley. We know there are many people who, who worship, I'll just put it that way, Mary. It's called Mary idolatry, really. May I say that Mary, a wonderful woman, blessed by God, needed to get saved just like you and I. Mary did not, there's no pre-existence for Mary. Mary has no deity whatsoever. But how amazing is this? Her son did. In fact, both John and Paul ascribe the very works of creation to Christ here. John said, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Speaking of the word that becomes flesh, that's what we're talking about. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, By him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we read, in the beginning was the word, they, th these are fantastic words that ought to just grab a hold of us. So what we're seeing here, and I think what we must conclude by faith, is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always existed, have always existed as one. God in purpose and quality. Every every serious student of the Word of God will conclude that Jesus Christ is God. Amen. Secondly, now let us consider Christ and His His earthly manif uh, manifestation. When we consider the incarnation, God becoming man. There are two important truths that we must hold with all the tenacity of uh, the tenacity faith provides for us. First, Jesus became at the same time in an absolute sense both God, and we talk about this a lot, we preach this, both God and man. He, and this is important, isn't it? He did not become God at his baptism and then cease to be God at his death. That's not what happened. When he was born in Bethlehem, he was God. When he ascended from Mount Olivet, he was God. Second, in becoming flesh, Jesus, though he laid aside his heavenly glory, in no sense laid aside his deity. No way. 
This had to be true for his full deity and complete humanity were necessary if his death on the cross was to have redeeming value for humanity. What, what a tremendous truth. The more we study, the more we delve into what the scripture has to say about who our Savior is, the more amazed we ought to be. We see that our text declares that Jesus, and I have preached this and re-preached this, and every time I do, I just want to preach this even more. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's break it down a little bit. Look at this word with me, dwelt. Dwelt here means tabernacled. Jesus pitched his tent as a person would pinch a tit, you know, let's all go camping, amen? Let's go with the Johnsons and we'll, they'll pitch 10 tents and we'll pitch one, amen? That's what he did. He pinched his tent among people. In the miracle at Bethlehem, God became what he had never been before. This is amazing. God became Jesus of Nazareth. Furthermore, John said that he was full of grace and truth. I love that, don't you? Some say that Jesus was no more than a good man, and we hear all this, don't we? And what a sad tragedy that somebody would not know who Jesus is. Some might even think they're doing... Jesus a favor by saying, perhaps, you know, he was the best man who ever lived. Oh my, he was way more than a good man. But you know, the real truth is, there's where the problem lies. You know, we talk about people who are antagonistic towards the Lord, the things of the Lord, and we seem to be bothered, more bothered by that one then someone who has, I don't know, nice things to say about Jesus, but comes short of admitting that he is God. I mean, I got to tell you, there's no difference between the two. You show me someone who's antagonistic towards the things of God, towards Jesus, and you show me somebody else who might even... Uh, see him as a good man, a great man, and they're in the same boat. John declared that Jesus was full. What a great word. The sum total, if you will. Full of grace and truth. Okay, can I ask you this question? Is there anyone here in this group, and this is a pretty amazing group right here, is there anyone here who's full? <laughs> and now when I say full, what am I talking about? Full of grace and truth. Some are thinking some other things right now. Matter of fact, I was waiting for somebody to kind of chime in there. Is there anyone here that's full, full of grace and truth? Of course not. There never has been a mere mortal who is full, completely full of grace and truth. I'll tell you who is full. Jesus Christ. He was the fullness of God's expression, God the Father, God's expression of grace and the complete revelation of God to humanity. You see, we're not talking about a great teacher. We're not talking about a moral authority. We're not talking about a good man. We're talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another significant work in this phrase is truth. What a great word. The Greek word for truth is formed from the word concealed or hidden. 
with the Greek word alpha added to it, giving it the opposite meaning. So truth literally means unconcealed. Until Jesus came, God Almighty was at least partially hidden from humanity humanity in uh, an aura, if you will, of majesty and, and transcendency. You could have a sense of awe about who God is and not fully know, no doubt about that. He was, for the most part, unapproachable by man. Thus, people had a poor, limited concept of God as a, as a personal God. As a matter of fact, we still see that today in, in many circles. People not fully understanding what we mean, what we're talking about when we talk about a intimate, personal relationship with God I mean, when you consider, when you when you look at some of the false teachings out there, false religions like I don't know, maybe how about the folks just right across from us, Islam? That what they don't get and what they can't get until they come to know Jesus Christ is that you can have this personal relationship with the God of the Bible. Not Allah, not the one that a prophet spoke of, not one that is distant and unapproachable. Jesus came and unconcealed, if you will, God. He shows us clearly how we can have this relationship. He became the complete revelation of God. That's why we preach the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. All 39 of the Old Testament books point to this New Testament. We have, we have complete truth when it comes to who Jesus is. I mean, aren't you glad to know that? I mean, aren't you glad that, that God has given us this? The book of Hebrews says that Christ was tempted. This is always good to preach on, isn't it? Christ was tempted in all points, like as we are. That right there ought to just, well... Cause us to appreciate that this is the kind of revelation that man needs. Here we see Jesus' humanity and that, that God allowed Satan to do everything that he could to deter Jesus from the cross. He allowed all this to happen. This was necessary to see if Jesus was truly God as far as the world is concerned, as far as anyone who might be observing all of this. But the real truth is, is there is no way. We are the ones who make that decision. What really is happening here, it was to prove that he is God. That not, that it's not for, it's not my call, it's not, my judgment, it's, it's understood that Jesus Christ is God. And thirdly, this gets a little bit in the weeds, but I want to go here, and uh, we can treat this a little bit like Monday Night Bible Institute, amen? By the time I get done, it might be Monday night, amen? That's good. Last, let's see Christ in his present ministry. When Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, he did not leave behind just a fond memory of himself in the hearts of his followers. This matters so much when we talk about the doctrine of Jesus. 
He had told them in Matthew 28, verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I mean, what about his present ministry in heaven? He is completing in heaven the work that he began on earth. And he's left us with work to do here on earth while he's in heaven. The phrase, right hand of God, describes Jesus' position now, right now, in real time, in heaven. Uh, and it's a symbol of his power and authority and glory. Part of his present ministry in heaven is the preparation of an abode for his church. He said to his disciples, I go to repair a place for you. John chapter 14. At the same time, he, he has kept his promise and sent the Holy Spirit to, to fashion the church and to prepare it for his bride. Two glorious projects are underway simultaneously. This is what's happening right now. God is preparing heaven for us and us for heaven. But you know, that's not it. That's not all, for sure. Christ also intercedes for us. Every Christian has a redeemed soul. If your soul is not redeemed, you're not a Christian. You're not born again. That soul is housed in an unredeemed body that sometimes disobeys and dishonors God. You know what we like to say, almost with a chuckle, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I think we need to quit leaning on that so much. Often we find ourselves crying out as Paul did, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? Romans chapter 7. That chapter sure needs to be in our Bible, but don't forget the victorious chapter 8. On the basis of his complete sacrifice on the cross, Jesus is our intercessor before the throne of grace. He takes our imperfect prayers and he perfects them. And he offers them to God the Father as a sweet-smelling savor. And so finally, finally in that we are only going to be able to have this much of a discussion about who our Savior is, who Jesus Christ, who the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ present ministry in heaven brings to completion and perfection the three Old Testament offices. Again, this sounds a little bit like Bible class. By the way, it's always Bible class here at Maranatha Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Prophet, priest, and king. This matters. Prophet, priest, and king. After Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit was manifested in him without measure, therefore possessing all the gifts of the Holy Spirit without measure. He was the full knowledge of a prophet, the perfected holiness of a priest, and the absolute power of a king. Prophet, priest, and king. A prophet spoke to the people about God and declared God's word to them. Jesus was the very embodiment of that word. In the beginning was the word. A priest, a priest meditated between people, and God. Jesus suffered 
in mankind's place, satisfied the divine holiness of God, and opened the way for people to be reconciled to God. And then we have kingship. Kingship is one of Christ's eternal prerogatives. Uh, he was born a king during his earthly ministry. Uh, he, asserted, he asserted his kingship and people recognized his claim. His resurrection provided his sovereignty as king of kings and lord of lords. And so, may I just say, as we anticipate Christ's return, Christians rejoice in the perspective ministry of the Son of God. For Jesus will in reality be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I got to tell you, I love singing about that, don't you? I love singing. the words penned for us in this great hymn, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drones all music but its own, or rather drowns. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Think about this. Think about how just taking a glimpse into what scripture teaches about our Savior, we, we all, I mean, we just, we're overwhelmed. And we have to be in agreement that Jesus Christ truly is the incomparable one. All false teachings, all cults in Islam and Islam and, and isms out there, Islam included, do not get it, do not understand it. And, and you know what? No one can until they understand first and foremost that he is Savior, that he has made a way for you and I. He has paid for my sins and your sins. This great message that we teach and preach begins with knowing him personally, in a personal way. And then as we grow in our walk and relationship with him, we can't help but uh, just be moved in a greater way and be able to say together, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. That's what happens when you get saved. That's what happens. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How about you and I? Should we be telling more people about this one that no one else can be compared to? I say yes. And yes, this truth, this glimpse into really some basic truth about Jesus ought to just cause us to hunger and yearn and sing as we sung a moment ago. But you know that hymn that we sang even before that, Which one did we sing, Jacob? Now I belong to Jesus? Look at these, listen to this. You just sang it, so I know you know it by heart. Are you ready? Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to Jesus to him. The next verse, once I was lost in sin's degradation, 
degradation. Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to him. And the third verse. I don't know if there are any other verses that are included in other places, but in what we have in our hymn book, joy floods my soul for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to him. It almost makes you want to sing. Who is the Savior to you? Who is this one that cannot be compared to anyone else? I'll tell you who he is. He is our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's all stand. Father, what a blessing it is to study your word, to appreciate that the more we delve into your word, the deeper we go, the longer we stay, the more we need you, the more we know we need to know more about you. And when it comes to our Savior, sometimes I think we kind of just brush over some of these important truths that we expounded upon tonight but we would be remiss if we didn't fully appreciate that we'll never on this side of eternity fully appreciate all that you are Lord all that you've done and all that you mean help us Lord help us to just even during this invitation Focus a little bit more on you. Just, if you will, pardon the way I put this, but just let us just love you, love on you, love you more. I just pray that uh, that we would do that more often. And, 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 and the joy that comes with this relationship that we have, nothing can compare. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen.